A little bit about myself. About myself. I actually uh, have served on the North Carolina Respiratory Care Board for years. Um, I worked in many different states as their Medicaid advisor for home care. Um, and what is really exciting about this conference, the Encore, and I'm going to even talk about Nexus in, in a little bit, is that we are now trying to promote respiratory therapy in the home. And that is something that's been ignored. One of the things Roxanne talked about, if you got to hear her speak, um, she did all of that, but from Medicare, she didn't get reimbursed one dime. None of what we do as respiratory therapists in the home did we ever get paid for. And in fact, if you've seen a trend, that's why I'm real excited about the new trends in respiratory <clears throat> and the new status of respiratory. Because one of the things that's happened was, um, when I started home care, there was a therapist at every home care dealer. There was a therapist going out, taking care of the patients, doing pulse oxys, whether they work or not. We were doing them. Well, I know. I, after listening to him, I just wanted to change my whole theory and also maybe go out and buy a bow tie and maybe I'll be as smart as he is. It might help. It might help. Thank you. Right? So, but anyway, uh, respiratory therapist and what has happened over the years, the last 10 or 15 years, some of the respiratory therapists in the home have gone away because CMS doesn't recognize and payers don't recognize or pay for our services. And our services are definitely needed in the home and I see a whole lot of trends. And for students that were, uh, I saw yesterday and for trends in respiratory, what I'm also excited about is many states now are talking about adding the additions of uh, care practitioners in the home where they're working like nurse practitioners can go to pulmonary offices and actually see patients finish up the scripts and we're seeing that more and more and a lot of it's in legislation it hadn't necessarily happened yet but uh, in North Carolina they're really working on it and they have schools that are offering master's programs as well as throughout the country uh, in order to get this technology so respiratory therapy is starting to grow and as a, although it's been around like 40 and 50 years even though you might have been an inhalation therapist okay maybe just me and Steve were inhalation therapists but not, none of that. Um, we're seeing, though, the trend to be what value we have added. And we're going to talk about that value added as we go through this today. Um, we'll go through the, um, the uh, creating a clinical respiratory patient management in the home. Why is this challenging? Well, number one is because very few payers, including CMS, are paying for it. So in other words, we add a salary, we add a salary of a respiratory therapist in the home, they're not even paying for that knowledge that's there today. We can do a trend to change that, and we're going to talk a little bit more about it. Um, we want to see how do we collect data in the home. So we've talked a little bit about uh, when we go into a home, what is there, how do you create a home environment that's good for the patient. You know, many times in a hospital itself, you're taking care of them, you have everything right there. Well, when you go to the home, you don't. So you have to create an environment, whether they're on a ventilator or whether they're on just plain oxygen uh, or whether they're on an IPPV machine. I enjoyed seeing the IPPV machine and people doing that. That was my first setup I ever did in, for a CPAP was using an IPPV machine. How many people know what that is? Oh, you do. How many people have used one? Ah, oh, yes. We don't have a young crowd here, do we? Yeah. <laughs> but anyway... Well, that's, I'm up here. I can, I can, uh, I'm up here. I can insult them. It's okay. It's, it's okay. They can talk to me later. Um, um, and what di data should be collected? What are we trying to do? And just was talked about before, we want to, if they're going to be at home, whether they're on oxygen, whether they have COPD, CHF, or whether they're on a ventilator in home, we want to improve their activities of daily living, right? We want to make sure what a great accomplishment sometime it is for our patients at home to get up, to go to the mailbox, and come back, right? Whether they're carrying their oxygen or not, that is what we want to do, and that's the ultimate goal of taking care of patients because what's the number one cost we deal with? Our readmissions to a hospital. The goal is we want to better understand what outcomes to reduce hospital admissions. We're going to go through and show you some costs of every time we send somebody home. For, uh, for individuals or therapists that work in a hospital, you know, you think when they get to the hospital, then they go to the rehab, then they go home. Uh, really, that's when their adventure begins, right? 
because that's when you don't want to readmit them because number one, there's a penalty for it, depending on what goes on. And number two is the cost just goes up and up and up every time they're readmitted. <clears throat> there's a climate for change in the industry itself though. Um, we're seeing respiratory patient in the home increase. We're, we're seeing a more of a recognition since the pandemic. You know, it was really cool to see everybody during the pandemic when we're all at home and our spouse just wanted us to get out. <laughs> um, okay, come on, you know that happened. You all know that happened. She said, don't you need to go travel somewhere or something? Um, okay, maybe it was just me. But anyway, what, one of the things that happened in the home is when they interviewed, you know, at first when the pandemic started, they, um, they talked about the stress that was on the physicians and the nurses. You know, near the end of it, maybe they were just looking, but I saw interview after interview of respiratory therapists being a part of that pandemic because the ones of y'all that were still in the hospital at the time, y'all had a lot of stress going on as well. You had to go from one to another, gown up, garb up, and it, it was kind of like working in the burn units the old days when you had to garb two and three times. And there was a lot of pressure on what we did. And so all of a sudden now we became accountable for what's going on. And CMS recognized and private payers recognized exactly what we do and how well our knowledge and how we contribute to the health care of that patient. So now we need to do a cost justification of what we're doing today. And you're going to see some negatives, but overall, this is very positive where the industry's going. So why seek accreditation? One of the things I do, I work for accreditation, and one of the things that's going on today is when you actually um, send somebody home, you're sending them home, but Medicare, private payers pay very little, if nothing, for what a therapist offers in the home. We're seeing a trend. There's some legislation to start to train that. So what do we do? We send home health care providers in there, and they are nurses, and they serve a great purpose, but are they trained as well in CHF or COPD than what we are? That's why many rehabs now employ what our expertise is, teaching them how to breathe, teaching them how to move. You know, we do all of that in school. We do all of that when we're in the hospital, but we forget about what happens when they go home. And if you're home, if you think about it, one of the things that we always forget of being in the home is what that person's like. You know, a, when you talk to somebody that's oxygen, uh, oxygen deprived and their PO2s, um, you know, are in the 80s or their SATs are in the 80s, um, you know, they're a little bit cranky, right? Because they don't feel well. Well, we have to deal with that in the home and we have to try to make them feel good about themselves whether they were smokers, whether they weren't smokers, whatever happened, we need to increase their ability to do things, and that's what a respiratory therapist can do in the home, in the home um, setting. Um, I'm not going to read these testimonials because when I started going over this uh, last night, I realized that I'm long-winded. And uh, yeah, I, you, those of you who know me know that already. Um, but one of the things we started was trying to uh, try to drive payers to start paying for our care that we deliver into the home. And I need to applaud Encore in many ways because not only is this a fantastic conference, um, but they've actually developed some things and some uh, tools to help us monitor the care of patients in the home. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that as well. The um, uh, so many people, there were, uh, so many home care companies that established this kind of criteria of working with patients in the home, you know, they got derailed by COVID. And I don't know if y'all have trouble with dates, but, you know, for two years, I can't remember what happened or what didn't happen because we kind of lost two years of what's going on. Oh, that happened before COVID. You know, is it instead of BC, it's now BC, it's, instead of, it's uh, before COVID, right? Because we, our whole matter of healthcare changed in COVID, even the way we clean equipment, even the way we um, monitor, you know, uh, virtual surveys, virtual taking care of, telemedicine, telerespiratory, it's all changing and in many ways for the better because now it's recognizing expertise that's out there today. So let's talk about costs for reimbursement. Do you know that when you go through Medicare and you send a person home that um, none of the respiratory therapy that you're delivered is paid for. 
Medicare doesn't recognize in the home environment. So we need to see a kind of change in that. And there's a, many ways we can do it. There are some third party insurances that are paying for exactly what we do in the home, but they're not many. They are starting to come up. I think in Tennessee, they have a home ventilator pro program that's working really well. And that was through a bunch of lobbying. And it's whether it's home ventilation, whether it's uh, skilled nursing. Um, so there's going to be a lot of opportunity for therapists in the future. But one of the things we need to do is show the value. And how do you show value? You have to show outcomes. You have to show that we are able to make a difference. And a lot of what Encore has worked on and some, um, like uh, Roxanne talked about earlier, everything she's done was outcome great. You saw that child skiing, that's a great outcome, right? It makes them feel very good about what's going on. And so it all becomes about outcome. And unfortunately, you have to talk about cost, right? Uh, you have to talk about cost because somebody has to pay for it. Um, as a respiratory therapist, that's where I got into the field. I went back and got my MBA in finance because I wanted to know how exactly, follow the money. Well, what can I do to make insurance company and managed care companies pay for the services I do? But what I'm learning now is Medicare is constantly modifying. So I'm going to take you on a little, a little tour of what Medicare does because I found out there's a lack of knowledge of all the different Medicares. Uh, if anybody... If anybody has insomnia, like I do, or works night shift, like a lot of y'all do, uh, you see at night and have a chance to watch TV, everything about it is about Medicare Advantage plans, right? Medicare Advantage plans. Today, we can save you money. Your dental will be covered. Everything is to be covered. Well, there's a positive and a negative to it. So let's educate you a little bit on what with Medicare goes on today. So there are four parts of Medicare. Uh, part A. Part A Medicare is what a hospital coverage is. You go in to hospital coverage. And why, is, why am I focusing on Medicare? Because remember, what we see happening is when Medicare does it, what happens? Private payers do it. They just follow the truth. Medicaid does it. Medicaid has a different criteria on some things. But remember, CMS is also Medicaid. It's just funded by the state. But it's still, well, somewhat funded by the state. Um, but it's still CMS, so their rules all go together. So under Part A, under Medicare Part A, they will pay for hospital stays. They will pay for skilled nursing facilities to a degree. Uh, if anybody of you worked in that, I'm not going to take a lot of time with that. And they'll pay for hospice and home health uh, services. So what's the trend of payers now? I always talk about follow the money. Why are you seeing so many advertisements? Because what they want to do is, when you sign up for a Medicare Advantage plan, then all of a sudden now there's a huge savings to Medicare. And, um, but anyway, under Medicare Part A, we're not recognized at all as therapists, as a provider in the home. Um, somewhat in skilled nursing, somewhat. And somewhat in um, uh, rehab, but, in, but that's had to change over the years. Medicare Part B, for the equipment suppliers, you send somebody home on a ventilator. You send somebody home on a, a caress. Oh, by the way, something that was said earlier, if you all have never experienced a caress or iron lung, you need to, I know it sounds weird, but you need to put it on because I'm going to tell you, when it tells you to breathe, you will breathe. It is amazing. Uh, I used to use... Uh, uh, iron lungs and caresses on a lot of people in the home to save them from being um, traped, to see if we could get them where they can survive. And I'm telling you, it's interesting. Um, I, I worked with a bunch of pediatric uh, pulmonologists, and I put them in an iron lung, and they, they realize when it's time to breathe, you will breathe. You can't fight it. You can't change it. So it's, a, it's an amazing experience to be inside one of those. And it, some of the technology, because it's bulky, went away, but the point of a lot of that is really good therapy. Anyway, went off on tangents, what I do. If I see a squirrel go by, we're in trouble. Um, but that's kind of what I do there. So Medicare Part B, what do they pay for? They pay for physicians, outpatient, clinical lab services, preventive care, home health care a little bit, and demi-post products. So you send somebody home on a concentrator, or you send somebody home on a, um, on a ventilator. 
You send somebody home on an IPPB machine, that's still listed. Or a nebulizer. What do you get for that? You get the equipment. You don't get any reimbursement for the respiratory therapist. So the people today and the companies today that are using respiratory therapists in their home care, I applaud them because they're not getting reimbursed, but they know the value of a therapist in the home, whether it's setting up a CPAP, you know, the knowledge of a CPAP. I'll never forget um, setting somebody up on CPAPs way back and they didn't even know why they were getting it. They know they had a sleep study, it didn't go so well, and, and that's the advantage of a therapist. In many states, let me rephrase that, two states, that's not many, um, two states require respiratory therapists to do it by state law, everywhere else does not. So you can have anybody set up a CPAP. Um, and there's no follow-up, it doesn't need to be done, and now, even virtual is some good, and that's why I like a lot of the companies that are doing the virtual and uh, kind of like you can contract with the therapist to do it, and there are a couple of companies here uh, that are doing that. And that's a huge advantage because now you have a clinical interaction and said, this is really important because we know putting somebody on CPAP in the home or even oxygen when you have to take around a tank, people stop doing it, right? They just give up. And that's not so good. So anyway, under Medicare Part B, they don't pay for our services. They only paid limited for Medicare, and that's come a home infusion, and that's for nursing. So that's limited. Let's talk a little bit about Medicare Part C. That's the health care advantage plans. I've always called it Part C, and now it's advantage plans. What's happening in the industry today? Why are people out advertising for you to sign up? Now, I'm oversimplifying this, but in a nutshell, what happens is Medicare says it costs so much to manage my traditional Medicare programs, which is A and B. They said it costs so much money. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pay a Medicare Advantage plan to manage you as the patient. So all of a sudden now, the patient itself is being managed by the Medicare Advantage plan. Medicare is paying the managed care advantage plan to uh, manage the customer, so they're out of it, right? They, they don't, that's not part of Medicare. And so they're getting money for that, and then what's their, what do insurance providers do? They want to save money, right? So you have to start negotiating and know really well what plan you're on. What has happened to Medicare Advantage plans? And I'm not trying to talk negative about them. They're, they, they all have their pluses, too. But Medicare Advantage plans, because of Medicare enticement to get uh, insurance providers or to get the public to sign up for them, it has gone about four years ago, it was about 17% of the population for Medicare, uh, medic traditional Medicare. Now it is 51%. They expect it to be 70%. And we're seeing a trend, and therefore, can home health, health services be cut? Yes, because remember, these providers are managing. They're supposed to follow all the Medicare rules. So anyway, keep that in mind, and do your research before you sign up for them. I'm not saying they're bad, but do your research before you sign up with them, um, uh, because it's out there today. And, and again, they're not paying for a therapist in the home today, but I think there is a workaround for that. One of the things that I want to promote today is under nursing services that are out there today, what happens with nursing services, uh, nursing services come on, they do home health, they have nurses, they have PT, they have OT, they have speech, they don't have RTs. Well, why don't they have RTs? Why shouldn't that be part of it? Because we can help with a lot of these diagnoses that are going home. We're is, I would say, better educated, that's hard. It's in corner if their specialty or not. But even our schooling are better educated for stuff like COPD, CHF. We should be part of that. And if we ever get Group A, Medicare Part A, to start paying for respiratory therapists, we're going to see, I think we would see a huge decrease in readmissions for these diagnoses. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Medicare Part D is a uh, prescription drug plan. It's extremely complicated. There are 38 different plans out there today. I'm not going to go into it, but just be aware of Medicare Part D is 
mainly the medication part of it. It was started for a really good reason, and then it got, as anything sometimes the government does, it's got so many different pieces now, like now you have PBMs managing it, and you can't just order a drug even though the physician wants it. Kind of like I said earlier, you get a ventilator, they're home on a ventilator, and then all of a sudden they switch providers and they said, well, why do they need a ventilator? Well, they've been on it for five years. Maybe they need it. I don't know. What do you think? They didn't appreciate that comment necessarily. Um, so you need to create a network in the home. What is creating a network in the home? You know, some of the times we get them, uh, we're ready to discharge them from the hospital, but if you give them the support they need, and you know, when we go in and take care of a patient in the home, I mean in the hospital, and they're ready to go home, whether it's oxygen, you know, we're doing that, we're setting them up, or they might just leave right away, but what happens in that transition? The more we're involved in that transition, the better it is. So if you get a chance from skilled nursing, their, their success rate is much better in decreasing readmissions if therapists are involved. Uh, you know, even things such as grocery delivery, pharmacy delivery, uh, support groups, diagnostic driven support groups that are out there today, a COPD group. Um, you know, it's, it's really interesting. The two groups I worked with way back were COPD and OSA. And both of them sometimes tend to be a bit cranky, right? Because they're neither not sleeping or not breathing well. Uh, so it takes some patience and it takes some skill of understanding what's going on with that. Transportation, things as simple as house cleaning. Do they have a support group? Um, without going to a lot of details because of time, because I got time. So go on to the details. I'm going to bore y'all. <laughs> okay, I'm kidding. Um, article in HME News. Uh, one of the things it talked about is they actually uh, launched a critical, uh, a chronic respiratory program, and it grew out of a pilot program where readmission rates from 24% down to 9% when they involved a respiratory therapist uh, with a chronic respiratory program. It's really cool. This is a network. Uh, this is the program. And, we, and it could have been a therapist. It could have been a nurse that was worked in pulmonary that was very familiar with that as well. Um, and the success of that pilot program led to grant from the state to expand it. This is one state, but they saw the need of getting the education that's out there today. Uh, COPD economics, this is really important. Now these came from the COP journal. Uh, I've seen some conflicting uh, information on this. That being stated, this is, wherever it's done, whether it's percentage, it's still pretty close. COPD patients account for 41% of all hospital readmissions, right? Because they can't breathe. They can't figure out what to do. Maybe if we were involved in that at home to help them, whether it's training on breathing, giving them the right flow, you know, and never forget going in there and what do they used to do? I'll just cut up my oxygen, you know. Well, most of the time, it doesn't really make a difference, but uh, we all heard of a hypoxic drive and all of the things go on with that. That being said, they're trying to treat themselves when there are other things and there are medications out there that help the dilation So, in oxygenation, so it's very important. COPD is the third leading cause of death. It is the only major disease mortality that continues to rise. Uh, COPD is the leading cause of disability which makes sense, right? Because early on in disability, they can't even do, and, and we always go back to ADLs, activities of daily living. Once a person loses their ADLs, activities of daily living, then they don't think they have any merit. When they don't think they have any merit, then they don't. Um, it's kind of like the motivational speaker we heard on Wednesday night. It's like, you gotta believe in yourself. And so that's some of the things we can do. How can we do it? And even simple things like going to the bathroom, going to the mailbox, going to get something from the refrigerator, that helps them survive. Uh, walking to the store, going to a restaurant and being patient enough to wait on them while they move that. And that's things that we're good at training people on. Not necessarily patients, because I'm not very good at that. But if you look at hospital emissions and you talk about following the money, um, they account for over 15 billion annually of hospital readmissions just for this itself. 
uh, current health care climate. Uh, delivery system is structured to finance uh, manage acute care episodes. So what do we do? We at Manage Acute Care Episodes, we in the hospital, how many of y'all work in a hospital? You know, and so you work in a hospital and the fun part about working, well, for me, was always the critical care. You're involved in that. You're making decisions. Sometimes we forgot the importance of floor therapy. But you know what? That floor therapy is where the patients understand their care and when they're going home. And a therapist can certainly um, be a part of that education. And we need more support systems for uh, progressive chronic disease. Uh, so sending them home, sending them home with a home care company that's going to help work with them, not just give them equipment. Pandemic changes. We have transition to home care was quick, right? I need to get them out, get them home, because they're going to be less exposed to that. Things were done for that. Higher acuity of home care patients, greater emphasis on the care in the home. Um, and we're going to talk about some of the things that CMS, and they didn't stay by. We're going to talk about some of the things that CMS did with that. The pandemic changes. Um, I don't know how many of y'all have been aware. How many of y'all have ever dealt with a hospital at home setting? Wow, so one person. So this was a huge trend. And when I am telling you, I actually experienced it in my life, well, the, a neighbor of mine. This was a neighbor that was on uh, chronic uh, dialysis. Well, we all know the expense of a hospital, but they were on oxygen, they were just on, they were, they were considered maybe this person doesn't need to go home, right? What did they do with this readmission, this hospital at home? And I'm gonna show you a website as well. Hospital home, they actually set up, went in, delivered beds, delivered all their medication, delivered their infusion, deliver their uh, feedings, deliver their dialysis machine. They set up a hospital room inside their room. Uh, and you think of it, well, we're just gonna deliver some equipment. No, guys, it was a whole hospital room set up in there. And they had, they had care, they had nursing care, and they found out not only did the transition work, but it also decreased the cost because we know the hospital costs are huge. So, um, and in fact, how was this done? And this happened in November of 2020, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid, CMS, launched the Acute Care Hospital Act at home. Without going through it, I'm gonna see, um, since you know it's just not a fly-by-night thing now, I usually mess up things when I do this, but you are here, oh, well, that didn't work well. Start without your data share, we'll just see what that does. Okay, never mind. Uh oh. So I'm one of the old school guys, and technology is not my thing. I thought maybe I just click a button, it's going to work. Okay. Oh, well, that's just a problem all the way around, isn't it? Hold on. I got an idea. That didn't work either. Even my mouse stopped working. Okay, hold on. Sorry, I can't sing or dance. Oh, go ahead for the question because I can't do anything now. For. Yeah. Well, great job. Since, okay. Could you repeat the question for the Oh, yeah. So he was asking for the workaround. What is the workaround of getting RRTs involved? So let me elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, what has happened is uh, there was uh, legislation that was going to allow the respiratory therapist to be part of the episodes for home health. And the legislation kind of stalled and then COVID hit and then it, it didn't go anywhere. But there was interest in it because people realized the value of respiratory therapists. So what we want to do when you go into home health, um, home health itself, they offer nursing care, PT, OT, 
speech in the home. Why not add RT to it, right? Because if you do that, I mean, it makes sense, right? We are skilled in that level. We're skilled. So what's happening, and what they did is they started legislation that they were going to add that. Well, I see a huge boom in RTs. I see a huge boom in DMEs, hiring RTs, contracting with home health agencies to provide that service with them. And uh, it was right there at it, you know, of, of passing it through Congress. Now, yeah, they got other things on their mind right now. Um, so it's probably not going to be done. And, you know, and it, the, the laws come up every year, right? And you have to have a champion in Congress. Being in my role, I've learned a lot about how Congress works and or doesn't work as of today. Well, they do have a speaker now. But um, uh, of what can be done. And, but with lobbyists such as, I mean, look at Lysinger. Lysinger just happened for RTs you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, really. And uh, that was because of the power of you all, the therapists themselves, said we need to be licensed. We need, because every state has it except for one now. Um, and that's because of Alaska, and that's because there's a lack of therapists is one of the main reasons. Um, but that's the kind of thing that we need as lobbyists and educating them on what we can do. And that's why we're going to talk a little bit about outcome data and how we set it up. So it is there. And getting, and getting involved with outcomes, getting involved with doing, well, I can, it's going to do better. Let's actually put it in writing. You know, home health and hospice, well, home health mainly, they have the OASIS data that all goes back to Medicare. Why don't we create something like that to see the value of what's going on? And I think that's where it's going. Um, we talked about uh, all this. Uh, how many are familiar with ACOs? We're seeing ACOs on the rise again. Uh, accountable healthcare organizations, what are they doing? They are actually taking, uh, they get paid more if they keep people out of the hospital. So they have to manage it. So they're contracting with different type of home care entities to do this. Uh, but I don't want to go back. I was going to show you the link as well as the hospital at home. Um, I think you can get a copy of this presentation. You ought to click on that because there's a whole group of working a hospital at home. And a therapist is part of it. A nurse is part of it. And you are really treating an individual at home. It's pretty amazing, actually. Um, these are the diagnosis is monitored, effective pulmonary, as they go down through it of what is now the emitting diagnosis now is falls, which makes sense. Um, um, coronary artery disease, cabbages, well, they need some rehab that's done. Um, uh, acute myocardial infection, pneumonia, congestive heart failure, and COPD. Look at the bottom three of them, right, that are there. Well, they're not the bottom three, but they're the three on this. That's something that we can be a part of, and that's why we need to produce. That's why we need to uh, push AARC and many of them to go to Congress to accept us as that home care champion, which we can be. Uh, how to change? We say proactive versus reaction. Uh, the home assessment is going to be very vital of what happens in the future, and. Um, so we want to make sure that all of this is being done. Um, let's take a look at successful RT lead programs. In acute care, they did a lead program of readmissions dropped when the RT was leading. So I'm going to lead, I'm going to take this, I'm going to give my expertise in this. The, and um, University of Davis COPD readmission dropped from 16% to 2.4%, and that was done over a 60-day period of readmissions. What a huge, huge savings to have the RT involved in that overall rehab. And I, I want to stress again, when Roxanne was up here talking about everything that she did, uh, it was really interesting. What she didn't do is saying much of what she did, she didn't get paid for and that is an incredible dedication. So if she's in here, she's not. Okay, well, good job anyway. But anyway, uh, that was an incredible, incredible thing that she did because she saw a vision and a need. And if you have that one child that goes out skiing or, those, or that one guy that went to law school, all of that because of her dedication and her team's dedication without even getting reimbursed for it. Um, so there are different programs here of successful RT lead programs.
because you have also have the patient assessment. This is what we're doing. And again, going back to the oximeter, whether it works or not, it's what we got today. <laughs> I'll leave the thing. And it does give us a trend. But these are patient assessments. And one of the most important things in the home that we do that is even um, not reimbursed for necessarily is nutrition. You know, COPD or emphysema patients, they work awful hard to breathe, right? Their nutrition is so important, one of the keys to everything and to rehab. Well, us as respiratory therapists go in there and look how well they're using or how much they're using their accessory muscles. We aren't doing that. Uh, that's not done normally in an overall assessment. That's something we're trained for. So if we start doing the patient assessment, even in the hospital before they leave, and have this as the goal for a home health or for the respiratory therapist or for the equipment delivery, it's a huge status. And it, it's a huge status change. And percentages have shown that what we do matters. Uh, setting goals for improvement. Uh, you know, whether it's peak flow meters that are done. Because remember, when you go into the home, you can't necessarily do a peak flow meter unless you have an order. Now, it depends on how strong your, uh, you as a respiratory therapist and your state lobbies and what your state rules are. But it's so important. You have the ability because it's all covered under your RT license. But if you're going to do it ongoing, you probably need to order from a physician and getting it back to a physician and document. We've been our own worst enemy about not documenting what we're doing in the home. We do it in the hospital. We just don't do it in the home. Uh, Post-discharge follow-up. Obviously, you need to follow up and document what's going on. Um, we talk about what uh, hospital readmissions, what data should be collected. Y'all can read all of this, but it's very important that we need to establish exactly what's going on to CMS of exactly what you're doing when we go home. Because remember, any therapy delivered in the home, unless you're under a private payer, is not paid for. But we still do it. Many of us still do it as well. Um, collecting data for out data, data, one of the things we've seen is like Berkeley did, like I've seen Mayo Clinic do and a couple of others done, is you partner with the hospital to say, this is what you want to do because the hospital wants to make sure that readmissions and if a company, excuse me, if a hospital gets a readmission and they're part of a ACO, then they're charged for it. Money's taken away. They give us and then they take us away, um, which is always not so good because I don't want my salary to be given and then somebody take it away. And that's what's happening. Um, Again, all the collecting data, and that's why I put this in the slides so you can actually take a look at it. Um, you'll have access to these slides uh, and see when you set up a program what you need to do to set up that program and how that's done. Um, one of the things we need to do, though, is we didn't have a good software to actually, in the dedication, to actually put something together to utilize the data collected for outcomes. I, uh, now I'm going to do a quick uh, advertisement, uh, carries into this room, but for Encore and for Nexus, because what we're seeing in home care is they actually develop. It's the first kind of system. There, there are several out there, but it's the first kind of system that home care companies are now utilizing. And let's take a look at what's going on. This is necessarily one different. I'm going to go, it's a Nexus flow work. So it is their own priority, but what you're doing is you're looking all the way at a disease management outcome program that reinforces therapy and goals. Uh, and there is no better access to what therapy can do in the home. And again, we can change that. We need to change it, and now we're going to document it. Um, so going around through here, therapy setup, goals, hours used, improvement process. Well, again, why would home care company do it? Well, they can go out and show CMS, look, I'm sending money, but they can also go to a private payer and say, Blue Cross Blue Shield, to a Medicare Advantage plan. You need to discharge all of these patients to this Nexus program. I, I probably shouldn't have said Nexus program, but I guess you're okay with that. To this type of data, to this type of data assessment program that's there, because you know what? I can look and maybe I can stop something preventing to be going to the hospital itself. Um, to go to a workflow, and a lot of this is hard to read, um, but you'll have three components of it. 
and this was actually one formed by a partnership, and the last one with a, a DAPT Home Care. I'll just put it out there. They're, they're just now starting this clinical management in the home program that's there today. And it's access, individual, patient, can, uh, plan of care, and alerts. And it's great because the therapist is designing all of that in conjunction with a physician. So everything we've been trained to do uh, that's non-critical care to prevent anybody going on critical care. Um, and although the goal itself is clinical focus, patient engagement, you need to motivate. You need to motivate these patients in the home. You want to close the loop, what the accomplishments are, and there's virtual problems too. You know, virtual medicine is a win-win for everybody if you can get everything going on. In a virtual conference with a telerespiratory therapist, hey, are you doing this? Are you doing that? Have you done that? Because you can do it on the phone, but when you're seeing them, you can tell if they're really doing it. Majority of the time, unless they're really good and creative. And lastly, um, a professional report overview. This actually generates a report. And if you take a look at this report, it's actually going through and saying, this is what we've done, these are the goals. And this intervention to a, a physician or to a hospital that wants to decrease readmission is so important. And this is the technology we can use today. You know, I, I go back and look at a respiratory therapist. First they were uh, OJTs. Then they were a two-year degree. Now you're seeing more four-year degrees. Now you're seeing master's levels degrees. We're moving in that letter. And if you look at the history of RNs, same thing, right? They were OJTs. Then they were uh, two-year degrees. Two-year degree programs you don't see anymore. Most nursing programs are four-year degree. And then they have the master's programs for their clinical and then the doctorate programs as well. We're seeing all of that trend with respiratory. We're behind. We're going to get there. And we're going to get there through the care that we give and your dedication to making that, making a difference in the patients you serve. And that's the biggest thing I want to talk about today. You can make a difference in the patients you serve. I am done. What kind of questions? Any questions? Yes? That's a great question. His question was, in Florida, they started a pediatric reimbursement program uh, there from Medicaid. By the way, North Carolina has one too. It's called the Independent Contractor for Respiratory Therapists. What happened was um, they actually moved some of that legislation over to ACCA, which is ACCA is, their, um, uh, ACCA is their administrative site for Medicaid, and they cut out some of that funding. Now, I don't know if it's still there or not, if there's anybody here from Florida to know, I, I have not seen that happen in probably six years, seven years. But it, you are correct, it was there. Um, and it may be still be there, and just nobody, it was too hard to get reimbursed for it. I, I'm not sure exactly what happened. But it, it was there, and it was, it's there. It's still there in North Carolina as well. Any other questions? Uh, not sure I can answer that one. Um, Could you repeat the question? Oh, yeah. So he wanted to know what kind of advantages or what can we do to stop the switch over from necessary Medicare Advantage to, to the traditional Medicare. Medicare Advantage, I didn't want to just leave. Medicare Advantage has some po very good positives for it. There are things it will do. The, the things, though, it's still new, and they're still trying to do, and they're still trying to push everything over for it. And sometimes things as simple as oxygen, even though they've been on it for at home, when they go to a Medicare Advantage plan, they need a new medical necessity. I've been on it for three years. I didn't just get better, you know? And, and so they're trying to fight the systems. There was a law passed, though, 
uh, that just came out that says anything that traditional Medicare covers, the Medicare Advantage plans has to cover. That was a fantastic ruling, including in the hospital and the home. That being said, uh, it's still a work in progress, but there was a law done for that. Yes? I just wanted this group to know that there are patients out there that are suffering because they have a Medicare Advantage plan, and yes, they do have to offer the same thing Medicare offers, but what they do in the end is deny these patients to go to a true rehab facility, say a 50-year-old man that um, had, had Gillian Barre, and when he come to my floor, the pulmonary step down, he could not, uh, he was so weak he couldn't write. He was still on a ventilator, and um, they denied him, a major insurance company denied letting him go, and it was a Medicare Advantage. And so I fought for the patient, he and his wife and I, and uh, the case manager at the insurance company wasn't too happy with me. But in the end, we got it turned over. So education, I think Thank she's- Thank you, Pam. Thank you. Patients. And I want to trust education is key. I will tell you my own personal story with it is um, um, my wife's being treated for some long-term um, uh, long term issues. And when she turned, got on Medicare, her secondary, which was the state Blue Cross Blue Shield because she was a teacher, they automatically moved her to a HMO. They automatically moved her to a Medicare Advantage plan. She lost all of her pharmacy benefits and they didn't even tell us they were going to do it. Well, luckily, I caught it. I, I knew, you know, I caught it like a month or two before it happened. And I pulled out all the papers. But if I wouldn't have known that, I'd say, great, because, you know, they called me on the phone. We're going to cover this, 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 and this. Yeah, but you won't cover this. And some of her medication was over $5,000 a month mm -hmm. that they weren't going to cover. So, um, uh, so I think that's, so I lived through it as well. And I just had a person call me the other day to work with them on it. So knowledge care is really, really important. So two things I will leave with, and I think I have a couple more minutes, but two things I will leave with is as a therapist, you need to start supporting your reimbursement and your right to get into the home under the home health benefit. Talk to your congressman, you know, um, talk to your state, everything you can do to make sure to show our value. Start using software like that's out there today. And the other thing on the Medicare Advantage plans, educate yourself well. There, there are good ones out there, don't get me wrong, that's there. But educate because it's their advantage to move patients over, but it's their advantage because they save money because they don't have to do the administration. The biggest thing is the administration of CMS. Um, I didn't know I was going to do a Medicare lecture as well, but <laughs> I, I can probably do that. But Okay, we have one question over here. Okay, so I'm a DME owner. I've been in business since 1989. One HMO, Humana, has just given a uh, value-based contract to two companies. Cool. One company got 33 states. The other company got nine states, and they've got two offices in East Tennessee, two DME dealers in East Tennessee. There is no way that those two companies can handle all of East Tennessee, especially for where I'm from. I live in Claiborne County, and we've got haulers, and we've got dogs in the house. And we, we got, you can't, they won't even be able to find the patients, but are all the other HMOs going to do the same? Is that what's coming? So they are following that. So first off, your comments, very well taken. And the best way to stop that, if you can, the best way to stop it is contact your legislation can stop that because that's what's going to happen with Medicare. Because Medicare, they're trying to do, they're try, they're, it's a cost, the path of least resistance for money, right? Medicare wants to save money. They farmed it out. Humana wants to save money because they can get a better price using two companies. They can't do it. For y'all DME people, that was like competitive bidding, right? It's a, but, but think about it. Competitive bidding. For those of y'all who don't know what competitive bidding is, I won't go into great detail, but I will tell you on the first round of competitive bidding, they had a company in Hawaii that won the bid for oxygen in Charlotte, North Carolina. 
That's some really good care. Now, it got challenged and it got taken away. But that's how they came out with it, going, Hawaii's just going to mail order a concentrator there. Well, that's what's going to happen in what you're saying. The best way to do it, though, is go through legislation and show them that, that it, it's what's going to happen in the problems with it. And, and you can subcontract, but again, you can only take a little dollar <laughs> and separate it. Two more questions. We have one here, but if you don't mind, we have one online as well we'd like to address. Okay. And the question is, are there companies? Are there, you do it. Okay. Are there lobbyists for federal reimbursement? Um, so let me tell you two things that are out there today. By the way, fantastic question. There are two, there are two organizations that can help with this a lot. Uh, one is AA Home Care. Um, they have a lobby group, and they have one spectacular individual named uh, Laura um, Woodard who uh, looks on this. You can call her, and if you're, if you're in DME itself, if you're not a member, although it, I realize the cost is there, they are a tremendous lobbyist for it as well. The other group that does a lot of this is VGM, and for the DME people that are there, uh, John Gallagher is a master of that. And where he understands it, you know, uh, and since their business is DME, they're the two lobbyists you need to get up with and say, this is what I want to do, where do I go from here? And both those organizations are trade organizations, and, um, and I'm not endorsing them, although it sounds like I am, but they do a fantastic job in working with companies and call them and say, this is, I'm not a member yet, call them, how can they help me? Call them and ask them. I think you're going to find they have the right answers. Is it done? Not necessarily, but they have the right answers of what to do. And then we do have time for just one more question. And you had a question over here, sir. So we are currently funded to 2030 for Medicare fee for services right now, currently. So that's only a short timeline. And I think that's why you're seeing a huge push for the Advantage plans, right? Because you're talking about the people are switching. Well, they're also incentivizing these people to sign them up for Advantage plans. They get commissions on signing people up for advantage yes. plans. And there's also disadvantages for Medicare people, right? So, like, say you get a patient and, like, if you switch, if they switch to this service, you could probably get it covered. Well, they can roll back to traditional Medicare, but if they didn't sign up for a Medigap policy at the beginning of the year and an open enrollment, they can't get that coverage policy. So they won't switch back, ever. What, so where is, is it patient education is where we need to inform these people? Because I don't feel like enough people understand the whole Medicare. They're so confused. You talk to them, they sign up for certain Advantage plans. They swear up and down they've got two plans. I have 100% coverage, and it's never the same. It's never what they say. Yes, and you are correct. And, and the problem is, too, is they have, they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars advertising on TV because they're going to throw in a dentist office visit. They're going to throw in a transportation. They're going to throw in meals. Why do they do it? It's not because they want to pay you money. It's because of being incentivized. And I, I go back to the lobbyists themselves. If, if they want to throw it in, that's fine. But they will stop doing it once they get incentivized that patient. And it has to be patient education. And even some of the older because I'm older, I know I don't look it. Okay, guys, come on. You come on, give me a little feedback there. I know I don't look it. Okay, yeah, that's too late. I had to ask for it, too late. But, um, but some of, the, uh, uh, of this that's being done is being just railroaded right to them without getting education. And uh, some of even the older groups that are out there um, are actually pushing Medicare Advantage plans when they don't really know until they sign up for it. So they think, again, there's some good ones out there. So don't, wrong. Okay, we are out of time, but this conversation it has been wonderful. And I see a whole heck of a lot of passion out here for this. And I don't know if there's anything we can do about it, but it does look like a topic maybe for next year. So we can try to get, you know, I mean, Steve is excellent and, and try to get people with his knowledge and more so to help with some of these questions. So thank you. Thank you guys, enjoy thank it. Thank you so much.